Hello, my name's Tim Island. I'm an investigative blogger. I like to get to the bottom of things, which means that I meet a lot of other <coughs> This interview is being tape recorded, and depending how this investigation goes, it might ultimately end up as evidence. I am Detective Sergeant 793 Terry Davis of Bedfordshire Police. I'm currently in interview room number five at Guildford Police Station. The time by my watch is 11.57 and the date is Wednesday the 19th of January 2011. Also with me is my colleague. I'm um, Investigation Officer 4191 Jim Fowler, uh, you. based at Dunstable Police Station. Thanks Jim. And we are interviewing, please state your full name, date of birth and home address. My name is Timothy Scott Ireland, I was born on the... <laughs> Australia. My address is Guildford, Surrey. Thanks, uh, Tim. You happy with me calling you Tim, rather than Yes, Tim? no problem. Thanks very much. You asked before, Wayne. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, Tim. So, right. Uh, the, the next part of this is to explain that you are not, I repeat, not under arrest. You are free to go at any time you wish. This is, a, this is a voluntary interview. Um, so thanks very much for, for, for taking part in this voluntary interview. Just a couple of things I have to go through. Uh, you are under caution for this interview. Uh, you do not have to say anything, as it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given evidence. I appreciate this is a voluntary interview, mm -hmm. but part of this investigation is that this may come to court if later on are you what, intend to use this interview as evidence. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for me to say whether it will or it won't. I understand. Okay. Um, what I will ask is, what is your understanding of the caution, which is this bit about you do not have to say anything? Uh, that the police are recording what I'm saying, and we may have a conversation that leads me to a point where I may inadvertently uh, uh, admit to something that is technically a crime or may be... Right construed as a crime, is that correct? Okay, not quite, not quite. The, the first part, um, again I appreciate that this is normally for people that are under arrest yes. and there's a, a, a criminal matter being investigated and chances are the interview would be used, but under mm. these circumstances I'm going to explain it anyway. The first bit is, you do not have to say anything, mm. that's pretty self-explanatory. Yes. You can sit here if you want to, I can ask you a few questions and you can sit here and say absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. If you do decide to go down that route, I and Jim would appreciate it if you were to answer to the question, no comment. Right. That way I know you've heard and understood the question, right. and you're not going to comment about it, I can then move on to my next subject, my right. next question. Okay, mm -hmm. Okay. The, the tricky bit is the, the bit in the middle, and that's a bit about harming your defence when questions rely on, on, on a court. That again, that normally is for people who are under arrest, they've been accused of a specific criminal offence, they give an alibi perhaps, mm -hmm. oh I was somewhere else. Uh, and we check out that alibi and then it transpires at court, they, they then change their tune and, and mm -hmm. do something else instead. Well, yes. the court can say, well, well, why didn't Tim say that in the first place? Mm -hmm. Not really relevant, but I need to explain it to you. Mm -hmm. So, just need to be careful about your answers. Because if this is you, and I find out you've been lying to me or you change your, your mind at court, mm -hmm. that can again go against you. Okay. Does that make it a bit clearer? Yes. And the last bit, pretty straightforward, we've got two tapes. Uh, that they're both being used. One will be sealed as a master tape, mm -hmm. wrapped up in a proper seal, signed by the both of us, mm -hmm. and they'll be stored away. <coughs> the other one will be a working copy, so if anybody needs to ask me to have a copy, mm -hmm. um, say for instance, to type up transcripts of yes. what was said, I can send off the working copy to so mm -hmm. that person, they can listen to it. So, the master copy will only be opened, again, should this go to court, and there's an issue as to what was said. Mm -hmm judge or magistrate might say, right, enough of this, get the master tape, open it up and we'll play it. Understand. And we know with the audit trail for that master tape, it's not been interfered with, not been edited mm -hmm. or tampered with. That's, so that's the reason why that we have the two tapes and what's going to work and set them up. Any questions about caution or procedure, tapes, etc. that you want, anything you want to ask me about that side of things? No. No, okay, right. Okay, thank you. Right, um, again, Despite you being not under arrest, you are actually entitled to speak to a solicitor. Mm -hmm. This is free of charge, and I know from the conversation we had before this interview started that you haven't sought legal advice and you don't intend to, but I have to ask you on tape, 
Would you like to speak to a solicitor prior to me asking you any questions in this interview? No, but as we discussed earlier, if the conversation goes to an unexpected place, uh, then I may ask to talk to the duty solicitor. Yeah, that's, that's quite correct. So um, this was dis was discussed previously, and um, again, Tim, I fully understand. If there's something that you, you think that's enough, hang on, I want to speak to a solicitor. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. You just tell us, and we will stop this interview and we'll get that arranged. No problem. Okay, great stuff. Okay, right, right. Tim, we've um, knocked on your door, we, that being me and Jim, knocked on your door this morning, mm -hmm. spoken to your home address in relation to a an incident that's been brought to our attention, mm -hmm. and it's been brought to our attention by the MP Nadine Doris. Mm -hmm. She has effectively made a complaint against you in relation to your behaviour and the incident at the Flitic Hall, mm -hmm. so I think it's Dunstable Road in Flitic, Bedfordshire, and that took place, I believe, on the 4th of May 2010. Can you, in your own words and your own accounts, tell me from the beginning that you think is relevant in relation <coughs> to that meeting, mm -hmm. how you found out about it, how you went there, what you did there, and how you then left and, and resumed? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> From April 2010, I was in an email conversation with a number of constituents uh, uh, in Mid-Bedfordshire about the conduct of Nadine Dorries at Hustings events and her own private event uh, called Nadine Unscripted. One of the issues that we were most concerned about as political commentators or campaigners or activists or whatever you want to call us is the issue of Nadine Dorries and her expenses. What we were not sure of at the time was whether or not Nadine Dorries was under investigation by the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards for her expenses claims. It turns out that she was. Now what many of us suspected was that Nadine Dorries was telling half-truths and untruths at these Hustings events in order to avoid being put on the spot and admitting that she was at least under investigation for uh, expenses fraud or suspected expenses fraud I should say. To give you one example, one of the things that she would do is say, uh, uh, I have never flipped homes. Now this relates to mortgages when the questions about her expenses expenses were about expenses Freud in sleep, uh, the question about her expenses were about rental properties. So I had reason to believe that uh, the Dean Dorries would uh, attend the upcoming Flitic hustings, which I was informed of in this email conversation, and either tell an untruth uh, uh, or say something, uh, uh, an admission that she would rather not have go any further than those hustings. You know, she would like to deny that she ever said it or that it was said in a certain way or she really meant X, Y or Z. And we all agreed in this conversation that it would be uh, uh, prudent to record it and get it on record. Previous to this, I had just conducted a live broadcast and recording of the hustings event in Godalming with uh, uh, the candidates from my constituency uh, uh, and there was no problem. In fact, there were four cameras there. Uh, the reason there were four cameras there uh, is because Jeremy Hunt had just had something to do with the... Um, uh, 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 it was a big thing that was a big deal to people on the internet, and I won't go into details. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people were expecting him to be put on the spot at that meeting, which is why all the cameras were there for that moment, to capture that moment. And the Flitic event was no different. The only, In fact, the only difference about the Flitic event was I was the only person with video technology. Now, in the case of the Godalming event, there were plenty of people with video technology because all the people who were concerned about the key event that might take place were all geeks. They're all techno geeks. In this case, they're all just a bunch of normal people, and I say, well, have you got a camera? Have you got this? And I mean, you, you've seen the gadgets that I pulled out of my pocket. You know, I have access to this kind of stuff. And eventually, the conversation led to a point on the afternoon of the meeting where I was invited to the meeting. Uh, in fact, the best way to describe the correspondence was there was pleading. Okay, uh, so with that in mind, 
uh, I took a web cam and a, a laptop and a, a separate video camera and I went to the meeting. Uh, I arrived at the public meeting knowing that I wasn't a constituent. I didn't plan on asking any questions. I didn't think that that was my right. I, well, even if it was my right because of Nadine Dorries nationwide campaigns about abortion and the like, I didn't think it was proper or fair to the people of Flittick who deserved to confront Doris. I didn't want to interfere with that time or eat into that time. I didn't think that was fair. The only role I saw myself playing was sitting quietly in the corner and making damn sure that it all got on record. So I approached the organiser of the meeting. It was the first thing I did. I walked in the door and I talked to Fiona Steele who had organised the event and was chairing the event. Uh, I told her that I planned to both record and broadcast, uh, uh, and she approved it. And from that point, uh, uh, I set up my stuff in the corner, set up a little table, plugged in. Uh, I powered everything up. I showed her how the equipment worked. I said, here's the broadcast camera. In fact, here's the broadcast going live now. And here's the video camera. The video camera will be recording this at a higher resolution. You are welcome to keep this tape. Okay, so she would have a complete unedited tape of the hustings uh, uh, the very next day. I'd be able to send that to her in a digital format. And that's where it kicked off. Uh, 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 Dorries had, I found this out later, uh, uh, from Fiona Steele. Dorries had arranged things so she could arrive late and therefore not face any constituents before the meeting and leave early, which means not facing the open question and answer session at the end. Uh, and the meeting had also been moved to a day that was like a day before the election. If anything happened at that meeting, there is no way it would have been reported in the local newspaper. Uh, the local newspaper editor actually intimated to me after the fact that he believed if the Hustings event took place a week before, that Doris would have lost the election on the basis of her conduct at that meeting. So, there I was, sitting there, recording. Everything went swimmingly. Doris was actually preening for the camera until uh, uh, the chair stood up, uh, uh, and for reasons best known to herself, I, I, I suspect, um, look, fair play to all the good people in my village uh, who, who work and contribute to uh, things like a history society, library society, all that kind of stuff. But occasionally they'll, they'll big note themselves. Uh, and I suspect that's what the chair was doing when she said, and we have someone here who's recording the events for our event, and, you know, and try to make it seem like more of a sense of an occasion. And I think maybe big noting it herself is a bit unfair. As I said, she was trying to give things more of a sense of occasion to, to uh, make the room feel as if something really important was going on. And in doing so, she gave my name, because obviously the, I identified myself. I, I even made it clear that I ran a website that was critical of Dorries and that I was here with people who were critical of Doris, and she said, well, it's a Hustings meeting and it's for, for everyone. Uh, uh, that's paraphrasing, not her exact words. When Doris found out that, the, um, that it was me, uh, she, she said, sorry, are you Tim Ireland from Croydon? And I went, no, and I could have left it at that. And she went, oh yes, sorry, it's just there's a, there's a Tim Ireland from Croydon who I've had to report to police for stalking me or harassing me or something along those lines. All of this is on video. So uh, from this point on, I'm going to give you the uh, uh, account of what happened to the best of my recollection. But I have a video recording of the entire exchange until the point where I say, right, the video tape stopped here. So if my recollection is faulty at this stage. I do apologise, but I'm willing to fall back on a video that's been made public and has been handed to Fiona Steele in unedited format, okay? Dory stood up and said that she had been forced to report Tim Ireland from Croydon to police for harassing or stalking her. Now, she uses the word harassment and stalking and she interchanges them, so I'm just gonna keep saying stalking from this point on, because I'm, that's... <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm happy with stalking. All right? Yeah. Stalking is a word like rapist. It's the kind of accusation that basically says this person has been convicted of the act and there are real concerns. It's the kind of accusation that, that, that provokes hostility in people. You know, it makes them think that I'm a danger to women. So in that sense, she uses the word harassment, but she most often uses the word stalker and stalking. So rather than say harassment slash stalking from this point on, I'm just going to say stalking for ease of use, okay? Because that's the intent. 
She claimed that I had stalked the MP for Croydon, Anne Milton. And at this point, it was clear she was talking about me, because Anne Milton is not the MP for Croydon, Anne Milton is the MP for Guildford. So I said so. I said, you know, it's, it's, I, I do think you're talking about me, but you're talking complete rubbish. Uh, uh, and she stood up in front of the entire meeting and said, uh, he stalks me, he stalks other MPs, he stalked the MP for Croydon uh, uh, and Milton to the point where she had to involve police. This is damn near the opposite of the truth. There is nothing that I published about Anne Milton or said about Anne Milton or did to Anne Milton that would make her think that she had to take criminal or civil action. In fact, I have an off-the-record comment from Jonathan Lord, now the MP for Woking, that she did not even believe that I libeled her. Okay? So there's nothing inappropriate about my attention uh, 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 at Anne Milton. However, there were activists working for Anne Milton who smeared another man as a pedophile and smeared me as a bad father, an undesirable alien, a pornographer, a computer criminal, a spammer, to the point where I had to involve police. So what Nadine Torrey said was technically kind of true in a funny way, but it was actually the opposite of the truth. She also claimed that I stalked uh, uh, Patrick Mercer. Uh, uh, again, near the opposite of the truth, it was uh, uh, associates of Patrick Mercer who harassed me to the point where I had to in involve police. And she said, he stalks me. Uh, he stalks me. I've had to report him to police. And I'm sorry, but this is an investigation. And she tried to bring that part of the conversation to a halt there, implying that because it's a police investigation, I dare not say any more. Now, I knew for a fact, being the target of harassment, that if there were an actual investigation into me, where an actual crime was suspected, then the first thing police would do would be to get in touch with me. You know, if they were in any way concerned about it, then they would at least come and have a friendly word, and here we are having a friendly word. I knew this not to be true. And even though I, I pledged to myself that I wouldn't take part in the meeting, all I could do was sit there in the corner knowing it was being recorded and broadcast uh, uh, and just respond quietly to the microphone and to... Uh, 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 well, I didn't certainly stand up and go, that's a lie! I just did it for the record. Every time she said something that was a lie and I knew it wasn't true, I would say, that's a lie, that's untrue, that's incorrect. And all of this is on the tape. Uh, uh, the meeting progressed uh, after there was kerfuffle. The, 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 um, uh, Fiona Steele asked me if uh, uh, I would be using this strictly for um, uh, uh, the, the meeting and nothing else, and I gave assurances along those lines. And there were crossed wires there, because I'd shown her the broadcast camera, I'd shown her that I was broadcasting, excuse me, uh, but she misunderstood uh, uh, the reassurances that I gave her and didn't understand that it was being broadcast live at the same time. So the meeting carried on for a little bit, and some woman stood up and said, this is being broadcast live, and he promised, and rah, rah, rah. And Doris tried to use that to justify her demand that I be thrown out of the meeting. Tim, out, out. She tried to use, uh, I don't know if you're at all familiar with politics, but uh, momentum is really big. If you get the crowd behind you, if you get the mob up, that's your moment to strike. So even though she didn't have a leg to stand on, she used that moment to demand that I leave. I stuck to my guns. I knew what game she was playing. I said exactly where I was. So I was at a public meeting. She had even called the police, or had one of her staff call the police, to be accurate. And a police officer was standing at the back of the room. Now, I knew, or I expected, that if I uh, uh, had done anything untoward, or even suspected, or even if there was a possible breach of the peace that the police officer was concerned about, then they would step in at that point. So I was perfectly comfortable with sticking to my guns and just sitting exactly where I was because I had every right to be there and do what I was doing. Uh, 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 so the meeting progressed. Uh, and then there was this whole argument about the uh, uh, broadcast or recording. And that's when Doris took the opportunity to again stand up and accuse me of stalking a number of MPs including herself. She then stormed out 15 minutes earlier than the early time she'd already set for herself. And I was informed later, uh, uh, stood outside and smoked uh, uh, for a considerable period of time before taking off. During this time, uh, 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 knowing that it would be important to get 
something on the record about what had just happened, uh, I approached the police officer and I volunteered uh, my name, my address, my date of birth, and that was the end of the matter. Uh, the next day, uh, because of the accusation that she'd made, I uh, uh, published the video of what had happened. After the event, when Doris tried to justify her accusations of stalking and her uh, accusation of uh, my being under police investigation, she tried to use the same event, that same event where she accused me of being under police investigation as the only evidence of my stalking her. Because previous to this, she, in fact, at that same meeting, she claimed to have received hundreds of vile and abusive messages from, from me. None of that's true. I, the only communication I've had with Doris relates to... Uh, uh, <clears throat> there was a website that was about her that went way too far, and I tried to inform her of the website, and I tried to show her the IP address of the person who was behind it. I thought that what it did, it talked about her personal life, it made accusations about her being an adulteress and all this kind of stuff, and it just went way too far. Uh, uh, apart from that communication, my only direct communication with Doris was about her accusations of stalking that she had made prior to this on Twitter and privately that had been spread by her activists. It's, it's a way that MPs have plausible deniability. They feed something to their activists and the activists make this thing and you say, the MP told you to do that. No, you're a conspiracy theorist. Rah, rah, rah. It's, it's an old game. Uh, but she completely misrepresented uh, a communication that only existed because of her accusations of stalking and presented that as evidence of stalking. Now, I know I catch 22 when I see one, but I'm in a position where I, I have to fight this and I have to fight this publicly because it's been brought into the public realm. It hasn't been fought through the civil system. It hasn't been fought through the criminal justice system. I'm being tried uh, uh, by trial by new media. It's a bunch of people with their websites, and they're all a tight group of far-right conservatives, and they all know each other. They go out to dinner with each other. They go out to drinks with each other. And they're all backing each other up with, with smoke and claiming that there's no smoke without fire when they're the ones generating the smoke. Now, the reason why what Dory said was so dangerous to me and my family was at the time, there was, I believe it was in progress at the time, uh, uh, there was a police investigation into a man called Charlie Flowers and another man called Dominic Whiteman, who's basically the ringleader in the entire event. But Charlie Flowers was doing most of the deeds. And what Charlie Flowers would do would be to uh, uh, broadcast my home address next to, the, next to the accusation that I stalked MPs, sent death threats to MPs, stalked women, and most of this, if not all of this, uh, a specific accusation was based on the accusations of Nadine Dorries. So for Nadine Dorries to stand up in a meeting knowing this, as I said, my communication to her was about my concerns about this. Her office were, were, were aware of it, and it would have been a severe dereliction of her not to be aware of it herself. For her to stand up in a meeting like that and claim that I had stalked two other MPs and that I was currently under police investigation would do nothing but set them off, and that's exactly what it did. They went ballistic. They started claiming that Dean Dorries confirms this, and that Dean Dorries confirms that, and the problem just got worse and worse and worse. Now, these are people who have uh, uh, broadcast my exact address around the internet, knowing that it causes me fear, and even threatened to come around my house and start a fist fight. You know, and it's, we're talking a pattern. It's not just the accusations of stalking that these people write off. They began by trying to accuse me of pedophilia. Okay? And then they began by trying to accuse me of association with religious extremists and far left interests, so far to the left that I'm carrying Molotov cocktails around in my bag. That's not an actual ac accusation. I'm paraphrasing there, but that's the impression that they're trying to give. Now, what this pattern shows is the type of accusation matched to my home address that's trying to either make people hostile to me to the point where they come to my house and do me a damage, or they're trying to make me afraid of the same thing. And it's on that basis that I reported them to police for harassment. Now, the only reason that particular investigation closed was because these people were primarily operating anonymously with anonymous accounts based in uh, America, which is very expensive to chase, it's impractical to chase, and even if they managed to identify 
a computer belonging to Charlie Flowers that was used for it, he could say, I didn't touch the keyboard. <laughs> and he'd be in the clear. And he's the kind of person who's been arrested by police and got away with this. They knew exactly what they were dealing with, so the CPS turned around at the end of the day and said, look, there's, there's basically two reasons. Uh, one is we, it's just too difficult to prove that these people did it, and the other thing is even if we could prove they did it, they'd deny it and they'd probably get away with it. So that basically explains why that investigation didn't go anywhere and why no one was actually charged with anything. Uh, uh, but the concern is ongoing. The problem is still ongoing. The current investigation has to do with a man called Dominic Wyman, and he's he's the reason for all of this uh, uh, fuss. Uh, he turned up in February 2009, and uh, for reasons that I'm still trying to work out, he convinced another man that I was a convicted pedophile. Um, it's my belief that he. Uh, I have I have a lot of circumstantial evidence. It's not enough for a conviction at this stage by the looks of things. As I say, it's with the fourth solicitor. It is my belief that he turned up in uh, January, February 2009 with the intention of uh, 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 having me smeared as a convicted pedophile from the outset. When he was arranging a meeting with me, he was um, uh, 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 briefing this man, Glenn Genby, saying, this guy's a convicted pedophile, he's escaped justice, here's his address. And the only thing that stopped the accusation of pedophilia being matched to the address was Glenn Genby, even though he went out to over 50 websites accusing him of ped pedophilia. And most of these are still live, by the way. Google will not remove them. Uh, uh, the only thing that stopped him from publishing that address was, was his own conscience. You know, he still thought, even though he believed at that stage, or I believe he believed at that stage that I was a convicted pedophile, he still couldn't bring himself to publish my address alongside the accusation. But he damn well made the accusation repeatedly, and I had good reason to believe that uh, uh, he had every intention to do at that stage. So this is the uh, uh, environment into which Doris released this accusation of stalking, and she had no evidence. She had nothing to support this. I'd never been to Bedfordshire before. I'd never confronted Doris at Westminster, for example, before. I've never been in Doris' presence ever before. There is absolutely no behaviour of mine that could lead her to believe that I were following her, or pursuing her, or uh, watching her house, uh, uh, or anything like that. But she would continually imply that I was. Prior to the Flitic event, she would use a little trick where she makes the same accusation about two people. And because she's not making a specific accusation about one person, it's very difficult, unless the two people agree to pursue civil proceedings, to battle that. So, for instance, there was a guy called Chris... Uh, Chris Paul. Uh, Chris Paul is a, a blogger and a researcher who has written about Nadine Dorries, uh, probably more than I have, actually. Uh, in fact, we're probably level pegging. Uh, but his interest is very much about research. He's very much a... Uh, he will look at the documents and work things out and, and come to people with evidence, questions some implications that, you know, it's, he's not my style of blogger, but at the same time, I certainly wouldn't regard him to be a concern. Pro just prior to the Flittick event, Dorries found out that uh, Chris Paul had come to Bedfordshire to source something locally. He certainly wasn't pursuing Dorries specifically. He didn't go to her home or any one of her number of homes or, or, or anywhere near anything like that. He was trying to look up financial records that were only contained in Bedfordshire. That's the, my understanding of it, anyway. Uh, and he travelled there from Manchester. Dorries, immediately after the Flitic event, tried to imply that Chris Paul had come down from Manchester on that day. She tried to conflate the two events. She tried to conflate two entirely separate dates and tried to accuse him of stalking at the same time. You remember what I said before about momentum? She thought, here's my chance to get them both. So my basic thing I'm saying to you is that this was a smear. And this is a corner that she's painted herself into where she feels, uh, uh, she's probably right, uh, uh, that her only remaining move, if she's to survive in an, as an MP, is to successfully have me even just question under caution as a potential stalker, which she can then present as evidence.
Do you have any questions? I'm sorry, but I do have to go to another meeting. Can I just explain something to you before I leave? I get very explicit information from this man. My poor staff at the back of the room have to read it on a daily basis. He has harassed the MP for Croy and Milton to the point where she's had to involve Lie. the police. He stalks her, he stalks me, and he stalks me. Lie. Okay, well, that's not something I expected, I've got to say. Actually putting the exact location on, it's still giving her, her constituents a flavour of what she does without actually, you know, kind of jeopardising her security by publishing exact details of her location when there are people who have proved themselves out there to be willing to turn up and almost vi fil film themselves, you know, stalking her and turning up to her events when they're not even constituents and putting them on the internet. I'd be pretty worried. <laughs>